need to speak. Thank you very much, Councilor Kerr. I uh, greatly appreciate it. Councilor McCaughey, good evening. You have the floor. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. McGarry. Um, I wanted to ask you first, uh, I understand the provincial government is making some changes with the LIN. Uh, is that going to affect the layout of this that you're proposing? We're not aware of any effects. The application, the application process goes into the uh, provincial government. But it's going in on behalf of the East Central Lynn? It's going on behalf of uh, the partnership of Lake Ridge Health, Public Health, and the John Howard Society. Okay. And so you're the proponents, and you've come through with this survey and the slides. If you don't mind, I would like to look at some particulars of the slides. If you could go back to the first one, please. The first. I'm um, the first one with the graph or the, yeah. The BIA or the public consultation? Oh, the very first, the very, very first, first slide. The very the, first slide. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, you've got the number of deaths from 2013 to 2017 on the bottom, and that's for the region of Durham. Do you, have you calculated uh, figuring that out in relation to the population growth? Because it has gone up substantially, right? Um, and that top graph that goes way up, that's just uh, emergency department visits, right? So um, if you could go to the next slide, I think uh, maybe the one that you have the heat so data. So on, on, on your comment, I believe, and, and I may stand corrected, I believe that the population growth within the region of Durham is increasing by about 1% per year? I think it's quite a bit more. Okay, all right. Quite so a bit it's, more. It's, okay. it's grown. Okay, but I think this would can, be... Okay. Yeah, if you could go on to, um, the, I think, this heat map. Uh, you had that in the library. I came to your open house, and uh, there was a speaker there that indicated... This is an overlay, as you say, it's not of uh, overdose fatalities, it's just EMS calls. Right. And that person indicated to us, because I was there with a friend, that this is a concentrated, there are areas in that big hot spot that are completely free of, of EMS calls, right? Yes, yeah, so if you can imagine where it's the most red would be the highest number of calls. So each call would represent, if you can imagine, a dot. And of course, there would be streets that don't have a dot because they haven't gone to a call for an overdose related to opioids. But as the dot dots become more dense, the color shifts throughout the color gradient. So what over what period of time is this? This is a 2017-2018 data. Two years, okay. Yes. And then in the corner you say Oshawa is ranked sixth in Ontario. Um, that, you had a graph it, that uh, actually you brought to the last meeting. And you had called it Oshawa, but it's the um, Metropolitan Census Area for Oshawa. Uh, it, it said that on the graph. Do you understand that the Census Metropolitan Area for Oshawa includes Whitby and Clarington? Are you familiar with that? S sorry, could you repeat the question? That okay, so when you say Oshawa is ranked six, that's the chart where actually Peterborough was third and Oshawa came sixth. Yes, that was put together by Public Health Ontario. Yes, and it says on the public health, it's which you indicated to go online to, and I did, and I noticed there and on your map, it says Census Metropolitan Oshawa, which is a, an area that takes in, sorry, Whitby and Clarington. It's been around, uh, I think Mayor Gray could elaborate why, and I'm not too sure. Sorry, Councillor Gray, former mayor. Uh, it was used a, a fair bit at one time. Um, not so much now, but uh, there we go. Uh, if you could go on to, um, I'm sorry, the, the letter that you had from that individual uh, that attended your RAM clinic. So when you said that just came in recently. It's a lovely letter. It's nice to see that you've got such a good endorsement. But uh, that RAM clinic, that's only been around, you said, 18, a year and a half. Yes, yeah, opened uh, January of 2018. I really hope she's on her way to recovery. Um, but what I've understood is that's a very difficult, difficult thing. As you know, with Pinewood, you have people that come back. So that's great to see that. But I, I wanted to ask you um, if you could go to that chart that had the 81 individuals in the first six weeks, you, your six-week-old pilot project. Now, those 81 people, they went to, you connected them to all these places that you've listed, um, CAMH, uh, the residential withdrawal, but uh, these are not all um, illicit drug users. 
are they? These 81 people that came in. You have addiction centers for um, eating disorders. You have the, the broad section of addictions, right? So I'm just wondering when you say 81 people connected to these sites, how many of those 81 are actual illicit drug users? 81 were opioid users. Opioid with injection? Uh, a range of different opioids. Okay, and, would they be the type that would go to the treatment center, the consumption and treatment center that you're looking, the model that you're looking for? They might be. Might be, okay. So um, the other questions I had, um, you're aware uh, this site that you have talked about at the um, Midtown Mall or Midtown Center now, uh, I went in there because I, I know when we talked well before you went in to see the um, BIA, you'd mentioned the Midtown Mall. So I went in to see what's available there. Is the unit that you're looking at, is it beside the legal clinic? They just moved. and Is it their old space that's opened up? Is that the one you're looking at? Uh, no, it's, uh, I would call it toward the center north, it's on the east, facing east. Facing uh, east. There's kind of a smoke shop door that enters yes. from the outside, it's the door right next to that. Okay. Um, so you're aware, I think after you left the meeting um, last month, uh, several people uh, spoke and one was quite concerned about um, if someone uh, is a, a user that comes out high and gets in a vehicle. Um, and. I said at that time, if you were looking at the Midtown Mall, you're aware there is a driver training school there, right? Yes. First time drivers. Mm -hmm. So these people that will be coming out, they may not be that steady, a new driver. Do you not see that as a, a, a problem waiting to happen at any point? So um, I guess it's a, it's a problem currently now, uh, wherever we are, if people are under the influence and driving under a range of substances. Uh, in the work that we do uh, across our treatment programs, we're certainly accustomed to people uh, presenting under the influence of substances and working with them if there is a risk that they are going to drive away. Uh, so we certainly have policies and procedures in response to that. Okay, so that was one issue. Um, uh, about the needles. Uh, I think the last uh, meeting you, we were quoted that the John Howard Society has put out 600,000 in 2016 and then I looked at the report that we had for uh, the city of Oshawa has an initiative where we're spending 200,000 um, on some helpful, um, some some issues. What, what, uh, if I could refer to the uh, mayor for a second, what are we calling that, that OUR program? Oshawa Unsheltered Residents. Oshawans sheltered residents. In that data, they had the uh, number of 800,000 last year, 800,000 needles. So we'll be approaching a million needles pretty soon going out, right? Is that uh, so logical to see that happening? So I would defer to the, my colleagues of the region, the John Howard Society, to comment on the number of needles that we're currently distributing. Um, thank you for the opportunity to respond. Um, the John Howard Society distributed over 600,000 uh, needles last year. So 800,000 would be incorrect. Okay, that's the d number that we have in our report for the OUR program um, that was just uh, submitted to council in January of this year. The 600, I saw that in your 2016 report. So it hasn't gone up from 2016? The uh, Region the, of Durham's report, 2016, sorry, they had said it went up to 600 and just over 600. About 630,000 needles. And that was last year. So yes. it's leveled. Yes, okay. that, that would be correct, 630. Um, in the research that I've been doing, I understand a heroin user would maybe shoot up minimum four times a day. Are you familiar with that statistic? I, I think, the, you know, it's hard to know what, what a typical drug user's pattern is, and I think you would see a broad range of drug use patterns. I say it, it may not be uncommon for a person to inject three or four times a day, but I certainly wouldn't want to characterize that as, uh, as a set pattern, for example. Well, actually, it was in Australia. They've got quite a bit of data there, and they say that of the users, um, probably... 10% of the times they're shooting up, they'll go into one of the injection sites. So they're not going in for every injection. Um, 
And I know it was discussed about the insight in Vancouver opening in 2003, but you're aware the federal government started that as a pilot project for three years, and they were going to shut it down in 2006. Um, but the associations there were very, uh, the activists were very, very vocal and strong and went all the way to the Supreme Court. And so that is still continuing, even though there was a government that tried to shut it down. So I understand if you open here at the Midtown Mall, we will never be, if there's any um, problems that the city would see uh, a problem enough to try to shut it down, we would never have that opportunity because that's go already gone to the Supreme Court, right? Um. I would say that once once the site is open and funded, uh, you know, we through through the federal government you get an exemption. You're right; it has been uh, supported through the Supreme Court that these services are allowed to exist. Uh, so, I'm not sure what, if you're alluding to if it went through a legal process or something. I don't have a case law to refer to on that. Oh, it's quite famous that, yeah, they I understand, actually, I understand what happened yeah. with within sight. Yes, okay. Right. So I don't think, they've set the precedent. That's how it goes in the courts, right? If somebody's gone that far, that's that's the deal now. Mm -hmm. we, we will not be able to reverse a decision if they're, and I, I think for the um, people in the gallery, we have a council of 11. You need six votes. That's what you're looking for today. You're here to get endorsement. So you're looking for six votes to have this approved tonight. But we did not receive this or hear anything about um, the site until tonight. So you're asking for that decision. And interestingly, um, Mayor uh, Carter started this meeting as saying this will be like a planning meeting, a planning act meeting. And now I'm on the Development Services Committee and I am vice chair where we do the planning act public meetings and before we start those, they're in the paper with a little black dot on a map of the area highlighted so the public knows where the site is going to be. Um, and uh, there's a process. It's public. It's pro If you don't mind turning to your uh, slide where you had the uh, advertising, where you'd indicated you'd advertised about this. Councillor McConkie, I'm just going to ask you if, if we can... Um come to a conclusion on your questions because I sure. have quite a list if you don't mind please okay. thank you so that um, first article um, that was initiated by a resident who was interested in getting that going um, and have you actually placed any ads in the paper yes about so this meeting thank you for your question the media coverage is the earned media coverage that we received staff interviews with Lake Ridge Health of the earned media that we received by request Print newspaper advertisements, if you see halfway down the page, are paid advertisements. Yeah, if you Online advertisements there. are I'm also sorry. paid okay, advertisements. Let, let yeah. the I just want, they want clarification. She's gone rather quickly. If you don't mind me asking, where are the paid advertisements? When did they appear? So we had the community events listing related to the open house. Those were paid advertisements. Print newspaper advertisements and online advertisements. All of those were actually released ahead of the earned media coverage noted on the first slide. Right. But for this meeting tonight, was there an advertisement in the paper? That's my question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I don't know how it got confused there. I, I'm not talking about did the open house at the library, but for this particular meeting tonight, was you, it advertised? Did, we did not advertise for the meeting. We advertised for the survey and for, to make sure people had the opportunity to pro, uh, give input during the consultation process. Okay, and I think uh, Councillor Nicholson mentioned, you know, the issues with the survey. I don't know how it's validated. The methodology that you used, I filled it out online three times. I did that. I have three kids. I thought, well, I'll see if I can actually go back in and do it. Um, you know, we had done uh, this city before, actually I was on council, previous council did a survey for the cannabis, uh, when it actually was supposed to go into the LCBO, um, so we never actually went through with it. But that survey was conducted in such a way that you had to enter your email address, and you could not go back in again. That's a legitimate way of doing a controlled survey with the proper data. May I, may I sure. respond yeah. that we do not collect uh, personal information, which would include an email address, because we want to make sure it's an anonymous survey. 
Councilor yeah. McConkie, can I ask and you I to wrap one, up, please? One last uh, area I wanted to ask you about. Are you familiar with Rafi Balian? It's quite well known, actually. Um, I picked this up. You know, I visited uh, the one um, safe injection site in Toronto. I went back to another one, um, Moss Park, and I was asking specifically about Rafi because he was an addict for 25 years and very involved, started what was called counterfeit, involved with the South Riverside safe injection site. And this is his, um, write, his writings from 2010, 2017, uh, telling, you know, helping people tell them how to inject uh, the problems with the, the skin erupting if the injection's wrong. Um, it, it's very detailed, very good. He was a, an advocate for the safe injection site, one of the strongest and well-known, most well-known, and still using. Um, he was out uh, west, uh, sorry, in BC, actually, in 2017. And um, if anyone would know how to avoid a fatal overdose, it should be him. But he was uh, attending a convention in BC, and he overdosed. Um, two yes, years sir. ago. So I just that's why I have Thank the you. concerns I do, and I would like to err on the side of caution here. Thank so I appreciate the opportunity again to speak. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Marks, good evening, sir. Good evening, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Mr. McGarry, staff. Thank you. Speak to me about the relationship that will exist with DRPS uh, if the site is approved. Will uh, give me a, sort of the an idea of how it will function in, in collaboration with the DRPS. Is there any collaboration? Will they be able to sort of police the site in and around the site, or is there a buffer zone they have to respect? Can you speak to me on that? Yeah, that's great. So uh, we have um, uh, Lake Ridge Health. Uh, we have a very strong relationship now with uh, Durham Regional Police, and I think uh, we all do in different uh, capacities. Uh, and in fact, we've spoken uh, at some length about um, the, the likelihood and the planning towards a consumption and treatment service. Uh, very good conversation, in fact. Uh, they, uh, they liked uh, the design of the model um, because of what it offers. Uh, so they were very pleased to hear that uh, it goes far beyond a place to use safely into all the services that I've previously described here. Um, and so uh, they, they note that their focus, and, and we recently, as part of the Central East Opioid Strategy, we met with all the police forces uh, that would be included within the Central East area. So Toronto Police, OPP, uh, Peterborough, uh, Durham. Um, and so we met with their leads uh, on their uh, drug squads and drug, enf drug enforcement uh, uh, people. And uh, they all highlighted that their focus as police, focus, fo as, as police forces are on dealing with the traffickers and so forth. They're trying to knock out uh, the momentum behind large quantities of drugs moving through communities and so forth. Uh, they are not concerning themselves with, uh, with low-end users whatsoever. Um, they are uh, well aware of and supportive of the uh, Good Samaritan overdose uh, legislation, uh, which means if they are called to a scene and uh, there's three people there and someone's overdosed and there's people carrying stuff on them, that uh, the Good Samaritan law um, uh, protects those people from being, uh, from being uh, criminally charged and so forth. And, and the reason for that was so that uh, people would not take off when their friend overdosed. And so forth. So we have a very good, strong, positive relationship. Uh, I would envision um, the RPS uh, f uh, to be uh, to be closely involved as we uh, as we went into implementation phase. Uh, we see them as strong partners, uh, and they appreciate the type of model that we are designing. But my question is, will there be an understanding that they're sort of not present at the site to not turn off users that want to go in and avail of the site? So will there be an understanding that they're not to police that area of Midtown Mall so that the, the user can feel safe coming there without having to have an interaction with the authorities? No, I think, in fact, that came up in conversation. Um, and there have been, so in some areas where the, where the pop-up overdose prevention sites have happened, they have not had uh, a very positive working relationship with police. Uh, I, think that, I think that our police have a mandate uh, to serve and protect our community. Uh, I think we would we would not want to put in place any type of buffer zone. I think by virtue of working uh, closely with Durham Regional Police, we appreciate their presence, in fact. In mental health and addictions, we work very closely with them all the time. Uh, we rely on DRPS to bring us people who they may find who are intoxicated, and we can help those people. 
So uh, I think the, the working relationship is a collaborative one. They have indicated uh, that, they, that police forces broadly are not using these sites as sites to pick people off, uh, for example, and lay charges. So, uh, so I think we would be not wise as a community to try to set up some type of a distant relationship with the RPS, but in fact to work closely with them as we always do. Okay. My concern is that if it becomes an unwritten understanding that DRPS are not to sort of be in the area, therefore to scare off any users, that it could become a breeding, a breeding ground for crime. It could be a breeding ground for dealers to understand that the police are not going to be there so they can sort of push their product um, at the detriment to not only the user but to society at large and that be a crime element. Can you comment on that? Well, I, th I agree. I think that would be. I think that would be a very short-sighted risk if we were attempting to create that type of a buffer, lo a buffer zone, uh, where we were not uh, welcoming our police colleagues. I think we, like every other aspect of the community, we see ourselves as working closely with enforcement. Enforcement, if you remember as well, from the four-pillar model that our strategy is based upon, enforcement is one of those pillars. So, by virtue of that, working closely with Policing services is inherently part of what we're striving to do, not at distance. Okay. And I think I think the the secondary benefit, uh, in relation to your comment, is that if you also do have the normal natural presence of policing services, then you're also going to have any potential issues that may arise in such an area, um, as uh, you'll have the additional support of Durham Regional Police. Okay. Um, speak to me now about: Is there any indication in your findings? Uh, that, that users will seek treatment? Is there a percentage of that you've seen from, a, let's just take the site in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. How many people that availed of the service sought treatment and were successful in that treatment if you have those numbers? I don't know if I have it from uh, Melissa. I don't know if she had that. I uh, don't have those handy. numbers with me tonight. Okay. Um, I have the community impact. So we know from not only Insight but Australia, which was mentioned already, they're a great place to look to, um, that things like publicly discarded needles in Australia for the surrounding area dropped by half when their safe injection facility was opened in Sydney in 2001. Numerous highly regarded studies in Europe regard the behavior shift from public drug use to using an injection facility decreased the visibility of drug use significantly, leading to public safety improvements which included an improved city profile, business growth, reduced liability to the, the city regarding needle stick injuries and harm, um, and reduced HIV. Okay, so there are some, there are some studies that indicate the treatment is sought. Yes. Which have nothing from Canada, nothing from Vancouver, nothing like that. So what yeah. I don't have, yes, is the yeah. link to what is the percentage who come to a safe injection mm -hmm. site and then progress to treatment within yeah. a certain period of time. That would be a valuable statistic, I think, in the future. Right. And, and we have to keep in mind as well that the, the, the consumption and treatment service model itself is a new model for Canada. Like we are, we are coming through, when we look at Insight, Insight was supervised injection. And the services that have popped up so far, even within Ontario, have been supervised injection. So we, so by virtue of adding the additional services, so we, we also see that there is perhaps a shortage or a shortcoming in the amount of evidence that actually exists because we have not had the full service in order to be able to evaluate that yet. The sample size isn't there yet. Right. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> speak to me again why we don't compel treatment when they come to the, when they come to the site. Why isn't treatment sort of mandatory or understood that if you're coming here, we're going to be pushing treatment on you or treatment options? So if you look at um, all of the stages of change literature and so forth in terms of how people change behaviors, if you go back, um, all the research that's been done by Prochaska and DiClemente along the way and so forth in terms of how humans change, they will typically go through a process from pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and they may cycle backwards and forwards and through that several times. With the average uh, substance user uh, making six to seven serious quit attempts before they're actually successful. So along the way, wherever someone is in that stage of change, you'll apply different interventions, different aspects of motivational interviewing in order to keep them within that phase and also to advance them onto the next phase. So if you speak with someone who is in the earliest stage of change, pre-contemplation, they're not even thinking that, that they have a drug problem, they're not even thinking that they have any issues, and you say, you should go into a residential treatment program. You have an inherent mismatch in what you are offering versus where they are 
and you are in all likelihood going to lose that person and you'll have a lack of success. And so what we can do though is we can offer people along the way everything that we can possibly offer them. But to place conditions on their care would not be, uh, would not be well advised. I think we need to offer people along the way each and every time what it is that we can offer for them today, what it is that we can offer for them tomorrow, and we hope that they will accept that offer. Because I can tell you from speaking to some of the residents that I've spoken to regarding this issue, if there was an element that treatment was mandatory or was compelled, and I understand what you're saying, you know, there would be a lot more support, definitely, if they felt that there was going to be some treatment at the end of it, not just a site to use and sort of go away and come back and come back. Because as we found out, there's not really a lot of numbers to see who sought treatment in Canada. So that's a concern. Um, have you approached other municipalities in the region about a site, or is Oshawa your one and only stop? We haven't discussed with other municipalities, given what the evidence and the data has shown us so far. So you're not successful tonight, or not successful down the road in Oshawa? Is there a plan to visit other municipalities? Not at present. Not at present, okay. Because I'd like you to, to really tell me how I'm to tell my constituents who feel that Oshawa is doing their part, methadone clinics, we have Duramedic for the needy, we have a long history of compassion. You were asking them to now take on another, I wouldn't say it a burden, but take on another treatment site when we are trying to turn around some of the elements of what has haunted us in the past in terms of addiction, in terms of trying to get a downtown that has seen some, dark, seen some down days into a more um, competitive business market and things of that nature. How am I, what do I say to them that they're asked now to do more? Is it, is it a compassion argument? What, what would you suggest that I say to my resident, or the residents of Ward 3 and the residents of Oshawa at large? And as a resident of Oshawa myself, yeah. uh, who I was also born here as well, so I know the town well, I'm very committed to it. Do you um, understand her struggles in the past? I understand the community very, very well, and I, and I continue to appreciate being a resident here. I would say to the residents, let's first look at the data, and then let's secondarily, let's look at the evidence. And so I think, you know, when, and, we, and we saw throughout the consultation process, there is a portion of the community that will not support this service. Um, we are not the exact same type of health services as oncology, as nephrology, and so forth. Right? where people are calling you and asking you to put those services into their neighborhoods. Mental health and addictions doesn't get those requests. In fact, it tends to be the opposite. So we need to use a broad range of information, public health information, compassionate stories, um, and, uh, and evidence-based solutions uh, to put in a community what we believe are the best health services possible. And all indications are that this community needs this service. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for all the material. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Council Marks. Councilor Gray, good evening. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Um, because this is a public meeting, I want to get to the public, so I only have one question that didn't get asked the last time, and it's a very simple one. Have any doctors or nurses expressed concern to you about your treatment at Lake Ridge Health Oshawa or down at Pine Ridge, and therefore, is this the reason why you're looking for another storefront? No. Thank you. Boy, you're good. Good. Councillor Hurst, good evening. You have the floor. Let's see if you can beat Councillor Gray. <laughs> you know I'm far more talkative yeah. than Councillor Gray. Um, appreciate you reattending today. And again, I'm here to hear what all of the folks in the gallery want to add. Um, I'm just going to fast track this forward because I think a lot of the questions have been asked and answered that I had. Um, I'm going to get right down to brass tacks here. The site that you're looking at is Midtown Mall or Midtown yep. Centre yep. or whatever the Correct. new, yes. I have to change our naming of places and get used to that. I was just trying to look up um, some information. Um, you have a willing landlord, potential landlord for the site. And as, because this is all uh, new to us, et cetera, um, does the zoning of that site pro provide for the, uh, your intended use? And if you don't know, may I ask uh, through the chair to uh, Commissioner Ralph if the zoning is in place? Commissioner Ralph for now. 
Commissioner Ralph for now, yes. Thank you.